Welcome to Bloodroot Literary Magazine. I'm Doe Roberts. April is National Poetry Month. It was inaugurated in 1996 by the Academy of American Poets as a way to honor poets and their craft. Today, we celebrate Poetry Month by honoring the feminist poet and essayist, Adrian Rich, who died last month on March the 27th at age 82 in Santa Cruz, California. She was one of America's foremost public influential intellectuals whose career spanned seven decades. To help us explore the inspiring cultural impact she made during her long career and to discuss a few of her poems, I am honored to introduce two of Bloodroot's inspiring poets, Phyllis Katz and Ivy Schweitzer. Phyllis Katz is a professor at Dartmouth College in the Miles Faculty, that's Master of Arts in Liberal Studies, at Dartmouth College. She is the author of All Roads Go Where They Will, and she's a Pushcart Prize nominee. Ivy Schweitzer is professor of English and Women's and Gender Studies at Dartmouth College, and Ivy is also a Pushcart Prize nominee. In a speech Rich made nearly 30 years ago, she summed up her reason for writing, for being, what she was fighting to achieve in seven words, the creation of a society without domination. Phyllis and Ivy, did she succeed? So we would love to hear your thoughts about Rich and have you read some of her poetry and also read some of your poetry and how she affected your writing and your lives. So Phyllis, you get the literary ball rolling and Ivy, you kick it along and I will stay on the sidelines. Thank you, Doe. Uh, I'm going to talk today about a specific essay that Adrienne Rich wrote about Emily Dickinson that has tremendously influenced my thinking about poetry and my thinking and teaching of Emily Dickinson. Uh, the essay appears in a book of collected essays of Rich's called On Lies, Secrets, and Silence. And it seems to me that one of the lies she was trying to correct was the whole vision of Emily Dickinson as um, a neurotic, frightened woman hiding in her house, uh, scribbling little in, um, unimportant, childish poems, uh, which is the way many critics read, have read her over, over time, uh, including uh, Archibald McLeish, who said of her, uh, we all were very fond of that girl. And that's when she died in 1995, at the age of 55. So the power of this essay, which is called Vesuvius at Home, the power of Emily Dickinson, is, I think, synonymous with the power of this poet and her uh, thoughtful approach to what poetry is and uh, what poetry intends to express. I found it absolutely uh, marvelous to read this essay and to have confirmed for me that Emily Dickinson uh, probably did not have a secret lover, that her, the he in her poems has nothing to do with some male that many, many scholars have tried to identify as someone in her life. I, I found her basic thesis that what Emily Dickinson is doing in, the, in her poems when she uses the pronoun he and refers to a male is, ex is actually expressing the, the muse of her poetry, which she puts in masculine form. So her, or as Rich would say it, her daimon. So I'm going to read a little bit of the essay first, starting with a poem by Emily Dickinson that Rich talks about in terms of this thesis, and then look a little bit more at how Rich uh, read some of the very controversial poems of, of Emily Dickinson. One of the important points she makes is that when a poet writes 1,775 poems during her lifetime, uh, including 366 in the most productive uh, year of her life, she is living for something besides being a recluse and is not hiding away 
uh, from the world for any other reason than that she is totally devoted to her poetry. And I love that. I wish I had that kind of time in my own life. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to begin with one of the poems that Rich um, reads, of, uh, discusses of Dickinson's, and read just a paragraph of, of her analysis of that, and then I'll read a couple of more Dickinson poems and talk about how uh, Rich then uh, develops this idea that, that po instead of being a reclusive, uh, frightened woman uh, hiding away from the world and dressing in white and uh, um, hiding behind doors, this is a woman who has so much power in her of cr and so much creativity that she needs to, to distance herself from the world for and able to be able to write the way she wants to. And Rich cites um, a, a a remark that, that Dickinson made to, I think it was a cousin named Maddie, when she said, when she went into the door of her room, here's freedom. So, so um, Emily Dickinson found freedom by choosing the life she did. So here's the first poem. It's number 315 in the collection of this, of the enormous collection of Dickinson's poem. Uh, and Dickinson did not title her poems, as I think most readers of, Dick, most readers of Dickinson know. This poem goes, he fumbles at your soul as players at the keys before they drop full music on. He stuns you by degrees, prepares your brittle nature for the ethereal blow by fainter hammers, further heard, then nearer, then so slow, your breath has time to straighten, your brain to bubble cool, deals one imperial thunderbolt that scalps your naked soul. When winds take forests in their paws, the universe is still. Well, there's so much in that poem, and I wish I had written, the winds take forest in their paws. I just love that line. But here's what Rich uh, said about this poem. Much energy has been invested in trying to identify a concrete flesh and blood male lover whom Dickinson is supposed to have renounced, and to the loss of whom can be traced the secret of her seclusion and the vein of much of her poetry. But the real question, given that the art of poetry is an art of transformation, is how this woman's mind and imagination may have used the masculine element in the world at large, or those elements personified as masculine, including the men she knew, how her relationship to this reveals itself in her images and language. In a patriarchal culture, specifically the Judeo-Christian quasi-Puritan culture of 19th century New England, in which Dickinson grew up, still inflamed with religious revivals and where the sermon was still an active, if perishing, literary form, the equation of divinity with maleness was so fundamental that it is hardly surprising to find Dickinson, like many an early mystic, blurring erotic with religious experience and imagery. The poem I just read has intimations both of seduction and rape merged with the intensive force of a religious experience. But are these metaphors for each other or for something more intrinsic to Dickinson? Here is another. And then um, Rich goes on and, and uh, presents, provides us with the entirety of poem number 273. He put the belt around my life. I heard the buckle snap and turned away imperial, my lifetime folding up deliberate as a duke would do, a kingdom's title deed, henceforth a dedicated sort, a member of the cloud. Yet not too far to come at call and do the little toils that make the circuit of the rest and deal occasional smiles to lives that stoop to notice mine and kindly ask it in, whose invitation know you not for whom I met, met, must decline? And Rich says these two poems are about possession and, sh and for Rich, and I think, and certainly for me, the possession is the possession that a, that a poet has of poetry, the need to write it, the need to express one's feelings, one, the innermost power in oneself that comes when you, when you try to write uh, poetry. And Rich also argues that, that, that Dickinson's poetry is, is the expression of a mind capable of, of describing psychological states more accurate than any poet since, except Shakespeare. I love that, that idea. I have been surprised at how narrowly her work still is known by women who are writing poetry, says Rich, how much her legend has gotten in the way of her being repossessed as a source and a foremother. And I, I, I think that is very strong also. Rich then goes on in this essay to talk about a very ironic poem that Emily Dickinson wrote in which she renounces poetry. And this is poem number uh, 505 in the collection of Dickinson's work, and it goes like this. I would not paint 
a picture. I'd rather be the one its bright impossibility to dwell delicious on and wonder how the fingers feel whose rail celestial stir evokes so sweet a torment, such sumptuous despair. I would not talk like cornets. I'd rather be the one raised softly to the ceilings and out and easy on through villages of ether, myself endured balloon by but a lip of metal, the peer to my pontoon. Nor would I be a poet. It's finer, own the ear, enamored, impotent, content, the license to revere, a privilege so awful. What would the dower be had I the art to stun myself with bolts of melody? And you can see the irony there, which Rich, of course, points out. Uh, that this is a claim that, uh, that she cannot be a poet, that, and yet it's written in the voice of a, of a consummately successful poet. Uh, and uh, it, the ironic rejection of poetry is, you must put that next to the, the number of poems that she actually created uh, in, the, in, her, in her 55 years. Um, so um, another place in this essay that really struck me was um, when, when Rich says, I suggest that a woman's poetry about her relationship to her daimon, her muse, her own active creative power, has in patriarchal culture used the language of heterosexual love or patriarchal theology. And then she cites Ted Hughes, interestingly enough, one of the um, important poems of the 20th, 20th century, and says, Ted Hughes tells us that the eruption of Dickinson's imagination and poetry followed when she shifted her passion with the energy of desperation from the lost man onto his only possible substitute, the universe and its divine aspect. Wow, <laughs> that's a male ego at work there. <laughs> Therefore, the marriage that had, thereafter, the marriage that had been denied in the real world went forward in the spiritual, just as the universe and its divine aspect became the mirror image of her husband. So the whole religious dilemma of New England at that most critical moment in history became the mirror image of her relationship to him, of her marriage, in fact. Well, what Rich says in essence is that this seems to me to miss the point on a grand scale, which I, I, I heartily agree uh, and, and agree. And then she goes on to talk about why Dickinson didn't marry and in fact she, the fact that she did not marry and her choice, which she then uh, brings us back to, to uh, Dickinson's choice to be a poet uh, in a wonderful po poem number 488 when Dickinson writes, Myself was formed a carpenter an unpretending time, my plane, and I together wrought before a builder came. To measure our attainments, had we the art of boards sufficiently developed, he'd hire us at halves. My tools took human faces, the bench where we had toiled, against the man persuaded, we temples build, I said. That poem was written in 1862, the year in which she first sent out her poems, and, and uh, she only published a very few of them. Uh, and she did not get a very positive response when she sent them to Thomas Higginson, who wanted to, her to edit, edit out the life of them, from, to my, in my opinion. So uh, one more, and perhaps the most important poem by Dickinson that um, uh, Rich discusses in this essay is uh, number 754. Um, the poem goes as follows. My life had stood a loaded gun in corners till a day the owner passed identified and carried me away. And now we roam in sovereign woods, and now we hunt the doe, and every time I speak for him the mountains straight reply. And do I smile such cordial light upon the valley glow, it is as a Vesuvian face had let its pleasure through, and when at night our good day done, I guard my master's head. Tis better than the eider duck's deep pillow to have shared. To foe of his, I'm deadly foe, none stir the second time, on whom I lay a yellow eye or an emphatic thumb. Though I than he may longer live, he longer must than I. For I have but the power to kill without the power to die. And Rich talks about this poem as the kind of epitome of, of Dickinson's use of the male daimon or inspirational muse, and she writes of it, here the poet sees herself as split, not between anything so simple as masculine and feminine identity, but between the hunter, admittedly masculine, but also a human person, 
an active, willing being, and the gun, an object condemned to remain inactive until the hunter, the owner, takes possession of it. She goes on, Rich, said, Rich goes on to say, the gun contains an energy capable of rousing echoes in the mountains and lighting up the valleys. It is also deadly, Vesuvian. It is also its owner's defender against the foe. It is the gun, furthermore, who speaks for him. If, this, uh, if there is a female consciousness in this poem, it is buried deeper than the images. It exists in the ambivalence towards power, which is extreme. Active willing and creation in women are forms of aggression, and aggression is both the power to kill and punishment by death. So she sees this poem then as a poem in which Dickinson experiences herself as a loaded gun, imperious energy, yet without the owner, the possessor, she is merely lethal. Should the possession ab abandon her, that is, the ability to write poetry, uh, uh, she thinks about that in this poem, but then she says, he longer must than I. That is, the ge her genius of poetry ha is more meaningful and lasting than her own life and her own poems. Well, that's basically uh, what I wanted to share from this uh, wonderful essay of, um, of Adrian Riches on um, a, a tremendously powerful uh, poet. And I'll just read a little bit of her conclusion, uh, excuse me, of her conclusion here, <laughs> and then I want to read a poem of Riches, and then I'll turn over this discussion to Ivy's. Uh, she concludes, there are many more Emily Dickinsons than I have tried to call up here. Wherever you take hold of her, she proliferates. Mm -hmm. I wish I had time here to explore her complex sense of truth, to follow the threads, thread we unravel when we look at the numerous and passionate poems she wrote to or about women, to probe her ambivalent feelings about fame, a subject pursued by many male poets before her, simply to examine the poems in which she is directly apprehending the natural world. And she f says, no one since the 17th century had reflected more variously or more probingly upon death and dying. So this to me was a seminal essay written by Adri Ad Adrian Rich, one that I go back to again and again when I teach Dickinson. I want to begin here because it seems to me that she cuts right to the heart of what any poet is about, and that is the poems themselves. That we can know all, all that we can, and there are the number of books on my shelf about the life of A Emily Dickinson and analysis of who she was and who she wrote takes up about, about this much of my bookshelf. Uh, but basically, the most important thing of all, of all that Rich knew about Dickinson was her poetry and the power of it and the truth in it and the psychological uh, tension in it. And the, it is, Dickinson is a voice that is as meaningful and alive today for us as any other poet of this world. So I'm going to close with one poet, uh, poem by Adrienne Rich herself. Uh, it comes from a book called The Dream of a Common Language. And because her essay was about power and the power of Emily Dickinson, I particularly liked this poem uh, because the title is Power. And here's Rich. Living in the earth deposits of our history, today a backhoe divulged out of a crumbling flank of earth, one bottle, amber perfect, a hundred-year-old cure for fever or melancholy, a tonic for living on this earth in the winters of this climate. Today, I was reading about Marie Curie. She must have known she suffered from radiation sickness, her body bombarded for years by the element she had purified. It seems she denied to the end the source of the cataracts on her eyes, the cracked and separating skin of her finger ends, till she could no longer hold a test tube or a pencil. She died, a famous woman, denying her wounds, denying her wounds, came from the same source as her power. Mm -hmm. That poem was written in 1974, and it's a wonderful, wonderful way uh, to talk about the power that lies in what we do and what we create, and how that is what makes us work. So on to Ivy. Well, that's um, wonderful, Phyllis. And um, I, I wanted to just make the comment that this essay, Vesuvius at Home, was also very important to me mm -hmm. um, as a poet and as a teacher of poetry, especially this notion that Rich is so able to communicate, what must it have felt like for this woman living in Amherst to feel like she was a volcano in her upstairs room? What did that feel like? And there's a line in um, the essay that you didn't read 
um, where Rich says, the woman who feels herself to be Vesuvius at home has need of a mask, at least of innocuousness and of containment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that in some sense, the wearing white, the being shy, the playing the piano behind the door, all that stuff is just a way of her trying to contain this force that was yeah. just bursting out of her because Vesuvius is the volcano that actually covers Pompeii, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. exactly. So, so it, it's, it's a power that's dangerous. She mm -hmm. feels herself to be dangerous. Yeah. So, um, but I want to concentrate on this notion of mask, and I want to mm -hmm. try to get to your question, was she successful? And I'm glad you, because I was going to quote that really beautiful um, mm -hmm. goal to imagine or achieve a society without domination. And I want to say that I think Rich brought us closest to imagining, to, to being aware of the need to imagine a society without domination. I can't say that we've achieved it <laughs> by any means, no. but I think she, she brings us to the edge of, 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 she brings us to a realization that that's what we need to understand. And for me, she really takes us many steps towards an imagination of what that would look like. And so I want to have that in our minds and then the notion of mask in our minds mm -hmm. because I wanted to start and, and just um, take a little broader look at, at, at Rich and um, begin with one of her earliest uh, poems, the, 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 um, the volume that really set, that really set everybody you know, looking at her, that, is, that, is to, that really started to speak to a kind of feminist or, or, or feminine consciousness with snapshots of a daughter-in-law. Um, which is 63, comes out the same year that Betty Friedan publishes The Feminine Mystique. And the poem, I'm just going to read the beginning of the poem, uh, or section three of the poem from s uh, Snapshots of a Daughter-in-Law, is unforgettable, and you begin to see her working to, to analyze her own personal situation and to see it as political and to see it as public. Um, and it's interesting, th in the title, in the title of the poem, she doesn't see herself as a daughter of the tradition, she se sees herself as a daughter-in-law. She's not even part of the inheritance, she's kind of married into the family in a way, so she's really kind of outside society, or mainstream society. <coughs> and she, this is the section that I remember, it just stayed with me. A thinking woman sleeps with monsters. Hmm. The beak that grips her, she becomes, and nature, that sprung-lidded, still commodious steamer trunk of tempora and mores gets stuffed with it all, the mildewed, mildewed orange flowers, the female pills, the terrible best breasts of, of Bodicea beneath flat foxes' heads and orchids. Two handsome women, gripped in argument, each proud, acute, subtle, I hear scream across the cut glass and Majolica like furies cornered from their prey. The argument ad feminine, all the old knives that have rusted in my back, I drive in yours, ma semblabla, ma sur. And those last two lines are a rewriting in feminine terms of the famous lines from Eliot's The Wasteland. Yeah. And what she's trying to say is how do we as women enter into this tradition if the tradition signifies the agent, the speaker, the poet, as male, as the brother. He says, Ma mon frère. Yeah. Here she says, how do we then become sisters, especially if we're stabbing each other in the back? <laughs> especially if we're just embracing all the old canards about the fact that women can't get along. And yeah. where do women get their power from? That's the question. But this notion of thinking woman sleeps with monsters just Really yeah. Mm. yeah. And so that was 1963. Her breakthrough poem, I think, volume is Diving into the Wreck, um, published in 1974. It was the co winner of the National Book Award for Poetry. Um, I remember going to see her read when this book came out, so it must have been 1974 or 75, in Memorial Hall on the Harvard campus. And I don't know if you've ever been in Memorial Hall, it was <laughs> it's huge, yeah. and people were hanging off the rafters. And it was like going to see a celebrity. This was a woman who was bringing us news about our lives that we had been suspecting all along. I was in graduate school at the time. And she, 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 she was kind of giving us some 
insight into who we were. It was like she was one of the most important kind of political figures for that that women's movement that was kind of cresting in the mid 70s and she just electrified the crowd she it, it was it was just going to see a kind of a prophet and i remember about 15 years later when my daughter was born i took her to here to a reading by adrian rich and she was in a like a baby car carrier on my <laughs> chest and i just it was like i just wanted my be able to be able to tell my Bay daughter, I <laughs> right, you were there when she read <laughs> yeah. her poetry, and mm -hmm. and I went up and introduced myself and introduced her to Audrey Rich. It was just a really lovely moment, and I got to tell my daughter that when we talked about it this past week. So the poem in this book, "Diving into the Wreck," is called "Diving into the Wreck." Um, I can still hear her read the poem that day in 1975 in Memorial Hall, and it was absolutely electrifying. I think it's a poem that some people consider her most important poem. Interestingly enough, she's written about this poem and rejected parts of it, and I'll talk about that. So I wanted to read this poem, and um, it's also important for me because as I write my poetry, I have a whole, as you know, series on diving. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of connect these two poems, and it's been interesting for me to go back and look at this poem and think about it, and then think about what that metaphor of diving means to me, and mm -hmm. means now how many years later. 40 years later. Diving into the wreck. First, having read the book of myths and loaded the camera and checked the edge of the knife blade, I put on the body armor of black rubber, the absurd flippers, the grave and awkward mask. I am having to do this not like Cousteau with his assiduous team aboard the sun-flooded schooner, but here, alone. There is a ladder. The ladder is always there, hanging innocently, close to the side of the schooner. We know what it is for, we who have used it. Otherwise, it's a piece of maritime floss, some sundry equipment. I go down, rung after rung, and still the oxygen immerses me, the blue light, the clear atoms of our human air. I go down, my flippers cripple me, I crawl like an insect down the ladder, and there is no one to tell me when the ocean will begin. First, the air is blue, and then it is bluer, and then green, and then black. I am blacking out, and yet my mask is powerful. It pumps my blood with power. The sea is another story. The sea is not a question of power. I have to learn alone to turn my body without force in the deep element. And now, it is easy to forget what I came for among so many who have always lived here, swaying their crenellated fans between the reefs and besides you breathe differently down here. I came to explore the wreck. The words are purposes. The words are maps. I came to see the damage that was done and the treasures that prevail. I stroke the beam of my lamp slowly along the flank of something more permanent than fish or weed. The thing I came for, the wreck, and not the story of the wreck. The thing itself, and not the myth. Mm. The drowned face always staring towards the sun. The evidence of damage worn by salt and sway into this threadbare beauty. The ribs of the disaster curving their assertion among the tentative haunters. This is the place, and I am here, the mermaid whose dark hair streams black, the mermaid, the merman in his armored body. We circle silently about the wreck. We dive into the hold. I am she, I am he, whose drowned face sleeps with open eyes, whose breasts still bear the stress, whose silver, copper, and vermeil cargo lies obscurely inside barrels, half wedged and left to rot. We are the half-destroyed instruments that once held to a course the water-eaten log, the fouled compass. We are, I am, you are, by cowardice or courage, the one who find our way back to this scene, carrying a knife 
a camera, a book of myths in which our names do not appear. 1972, earlier 1978, another woman poet, a woman who was also a poet, Muriel Ruckheiser, published a poem called The Poem as Myth. Um, I just wanted to read or, or, or mention that. Let's see where I can find it. The Poem as Myth, it's a poem about Orpheus, but what's important about this poem is that she, here it is, is that she at some point says in the middle of the poem, no more masks, no more mythologies, now, for the first time, the god lifts his hand, the fragments join in me with their own music. And that became a kind of rallying cry for feminist writers to mean we're not going to use the masks of Yeats and Pound, who writes persona, in which the mask becomes really an important method for male writers to take on other personalities yeah. and other appearances and write out of this kind of prophetic kind of Orphic voice. There's, she's saying, I don't want that mask. I can't use that mask. I can't inhabit. That mask is not powerful for me. I don't want the mask. I don't want that mythology. And then a very uh, fam now famous collection of, po of women, uh, po poems by women, um, is published, edited by Florence Howe and Ellen Bass, called No More Masks. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. under that flag that really women's poetry, feminist poetry gets going. But then we have to think about this poem by Adrian Rich, because she says in the poem, the mask, awkward and grave, is powerful, right? Yeah. And she says about Emily Dickinson, she needs that mask Protect. to contain the Vesuvian power that there's no place in the world for her to contain. So there's a way in which Rich is going a little, or she's, she's kind of at an angle to that the kind of feminist, no, feminist notion, the poet can exist without, or can speak without a mask, or we can speak or live without mythologies. And I think what she's trying to say is, we can't, maybe. Yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. Yeah. We need other mythologies. We yeah. need to change the mythologies. Yeah. Mm. So I wanted to think a little bit about this, the rack, first of all. Mm. <laughs> what is the rack? And many people have talked about it as her own life. She was married, it had three children divorced her husband, her husband committed suicide, it's not clear what the relationship of that was to mm -hmm. the divorce. Um, she becomes a very outspoken lesbian, she becomes a feminist, um, and, and one could argue that m perhaps in this period, uh, the, the, the late 60s, early 70s, her life seemed like a wreck, or, or heterosexual relationships seemed like a wreck that somehow women had to inhabit. So there's, it's a very layered kind of multi, multivalent image. Um, her life, our communal lives, and especially lives that are somehow s shot through with these heterosexual mythologies about how men and women relate to each other and who you can love and how you can love. Um, the woman's body, a wreck with its, with its ribs and the, 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 the sides of the boat, of the ship, look like a kind of a body or a whale. And we think of Jonah in the whale. There's lots of echoes in this, this poem. Um, so it, 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 it's a very kind of multi-layered image. Um, people have also argued that it's the wreck of 20th century patriarchal culture. Hmm. Western patriarchal culture, and she's entering into it as somebody who has to wear a mask. Has to wear a mask. It's dangerous, and also it's a disaster. What can be salvaged? This is a salvage mission. It's not just a, uh, a a kind of journey into the self or a quest for understanding. It's a salvage mission. What can we? What treasure can we get from it and bring back up to the surface and and use and make another kind of world? So there's the image of the wreck, that's very interesting. And then there's the image of, of, of the, 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 the diver. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the place that, that people have, that Rich herself has, has talked about um, is that incredible moment where she says, this is the place and I'm here, the mermaid whose, hair, whose dark hair streams black and there's echoes there of Eliot's proof rock. Mm -hmm. I do not think the mermaids will sing to me. I've heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think they will sing to me. Um, and then she, but then she says, the merman in his armored body. We circle silently uh, above, about the wreck. We dive into the hold. I am she, I am he, whose drowned face sleeps with open eyes. 
so it's almost as if she imagines herself as an androgynous yeah. figure. Mm -hmm. um, later on, you get that lovely moment. It's this kind of dis displacement of the kind of Cartesian moment. We are, I am, you are. And then the one who find our way, we, the grammar doesn't even work there. How do we talk about our communal relationship to these mythologies? Um, is she speaking in her own voice? Is she speaking as a single woman? Is she speaking for women? Is she speaking for women and men? She's now taken on this kind of androgynous um, persona. And she has said, and readers have said, this is problematic um, because we do have to speak as who we are. And I think later in her career, she rejects the kind of androgyne. She mm. rejects the kind of Wolfian androgyne and really wants to inhabit a kind of female um, identity and sense of power. What's, and then finally at the end, um, I want to talk about the book of myths in which our names do not appear. Part of I think what's going, she's talking about the way in which some groups of people are invisible in that, in that, in the book of the world. They don't, their names don't appear. They, they are, they're somehow left out. What does it mean to be invisible? I think she's talking not only about women. I think she's also talking about um, those, the, 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 those who are socially um, invisible in this world. And she wants to revision a word, a word that she makes, makes popular. She wants to revision the quest narrative. She wants to see the hero as a woman. Um, she wants to see what we can salvage from this. And as I wrote down here, the goal is a society to imagine a society without domination. Not, not yeah. easy to do. <laughs> Truly. Truly. <laughs> um, the other thing I want to point out here is lovely uh, echoes of Emily Dickinson. She, she says at some point, uh, towards the end, this is the, the, the kind of androgyne figure speaking, we are the half-destroyed instruments that once held to a course the water-eaten log, the fouled compass. And I kept on thinking about Dickinson's po poem, Wild Nights, mm. done with the compass, mm -hmm. done with the chart, right? She doesn't need a, a compass or a chart. And there's a way in which the speaker in Rich's poem is saying, we, we're in uncharted waters here. Mm -hmm. If we reimagine the book of myths, we're in uncharted waters. Um, so Diving Into the Wreck, I think, is a poem. What I love about Adrienne Rich as well um, is the way in which she revises herself and leaves the traces there so that you can see where she's been, where she is in 1974, where she was in 1980, where she was. You know, she doesn't kind of erase herself. She actually leaves it there because that's where I was. That was my truth at the, at the, time, at the moment, yeah. at, the, at the time. But then she went and commented and said, this is a problematic moment in this poem. I think that she goes on in later poems to actually embrace a, a specifically female, what she would, a, a kind of lesbian identity yeah. that, 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 that is very powerful for her. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to end um, with a, a response to the question of power because it's a, it's, it's a problem for women. How do we achieve power, um, especially if power is part of the kind of poisoned pie that we're offered by kind of mainstream patriarchal society? And I wanted to end with a poem that she wrote in 1974. It's called Fantasia for Elvira Sh Shatayev. And there's a little epigraph here. Um, Shatayev was a leader of a woman's climbing team, all of whom died in a storm on Lenin Peak, August 1974. Later, Shatayev's husband found and buried the bodies. The cold felt cold until our blood grew colder. Then the wind died down and we slept. If in this sleep I speak, it's with a voice no longer personal. I want to say, with voices. When the wind tore our breath from us at last, we had no need of words. For months, for years, each one of us had felt her own yes growing in her, slowly forming as she stood at windows waited for trains, mended her rucksack, combed her hair. What we were to learn was simply what we had up here, as out of all words, that yes gathered its forces, fused itself, and only just in time to meet a no of no degrees, the black hole sucking the world in. I feel you climbing toward me, your cleated boot soles leaving their geometric bite, 
colossally embossed on microscopic crystals as when I trailed you in the, in the Caucasus. Now I am further ahead than either of us dreamed anyone would be. I have become the white snow packed like asphalt by the wind, the woman I love, lightly flung against the mountain, that blue sky, our frozen eyes unribboned through the storm, we could have stitched that blueness together like a quilt. You come, I know this, with your love, your loss, strapped to your body with your tape recorder, camera, ice pick against advisement to give us burial in the snow and in your mind while my body lies out here flashing like a prism into your eyes how could you sleep you climbed here for yourself we climbed for ourselves when you have buried us told your story ours does not end we stream into the unfinished the unbegun the possible every cell's core of heat pulsed out of us into the thin air of the universe the armature of rock beneath these snows this mountain which has taken the imprint of our minds through changes elemental and minute as those we underwent to bring each other here choosing ourselves each other this life whose every breath and grasp and further foothold is somewhere still enacted and continuing. In the diary I wrote, now we are ready and each of us knows it. I have never loved like this. I have never seen my own forces so taken up and shared and given back. After the long training, the early sieges, we are moving almost effortlessly in our love. In the diary, as the wind began to tear at the tents over us, I wrote, we know now we have always been in danger, down in our separateness, and now up here together, but, but till now we had not touched our strength. In the diary, torn from my fingers, I had written, what does love mean? What does it mean to survive? A cable of blue fire ropes our bodies, burning together in the snow. We will not live to settle for less. We have dreamed of this all of our lives. Mm. Mm. That's an incredibly powerful poem about power. <laughs> and it's about a power in the collective. Yes. yes. And yes. it's about a power mm -hmm. that's, pot, that's a yes versus the no of society. And from yeah. the women we've talked about today, from Emily Dickinson on, power has been the, a key word. Yes. And the power has been in the, their written word mm -hmm. that they find the salvation. Yeah. And, or the strength. And, and the strength and, the strength. and, and can yeah. go forward and with or without the mask. Right. And I think there's not as many masks as there used to be. <laughs> hopefully, well, we hopefully. We hope. No, that's good. Yeah. No, I think, well, I, I think the masks are not as prescribed yeah. as they were. They don't have to right. be anymore. They don't have to be, it doesn't have to be Orpheus. No. Right. It can be Eurydice. It can be, you can have a female mask. Yes. It can be powerful. Right. Right. As opposed to. And that's what they started working for back in the 19th century. I mean, that's when feminism was coined in 1895, mm -hmm. you know, not, not in the 60s, not in the 1960s, yeah. but that far back, and maybe even further if we, we do some digging. <laughs> well, 1848, the, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the de Declaration of Sentiments, right, that was put together, mm -hmm. right, so yeah. 1848. But it is the power that is a key word in, in everything we've talked about today. So um, are you going to read us some of your poems now, Phyllis, yes. and tell us maybe how uh, Rich influenced your life or your poems or your work or <laughs> whatever? Well, uh, I think every poet I've read has, has influenced the way I think about poetry rich among them. I, don't, I can't think of any individual poem in my collections that, that specifically comes out of Rich, but I have been very enriched by reading her poetry and thinking about her development of her voice and her long and amazing career. So I'm going to read just two poems from my book, and then I'd like to read a poem from Bloodroot, which seems appropriate, <laughs> and then I'd like to end by reading a couple of new poems, uh, if I have time to do all that. And since I took out the... Right, the first one is called Green Up Day, and... Uh, 
I was thinking this is spring and green up, green up Day is coming soon. But this was my response to Green Up Day. How is it possible that I am cold blue, veined blue, woad blue, soul deep blue on a day when green is the color of morning and a robin is cascading song from the top of a beach? Yesterday I tasted deep of the bubbling nectar in my glass. I rejoiced in the sun, spring be beauties in the woods, Phoebe's hunting for a nest site. Joy was a Bach cantata playing the air around me, daffodils and for violets fortissimo in my heart. Today my eyes are knotted in a blue funk, ears garbled, tongue twisted, with words I want to say to you but can't. Here I am waiting for my mind to green again. Mm. So that's one. Some of my morning, some of my poems written in the morning tend to have that <laughs> outlook <laughs> toward life. <laughs> but another, another spring poem, this one was um, inspired by a poem by Stanley Kunitz. Um, it, it's called Phoebe's in May. All spring they called for hours while I was sowing summer in the ground. Plants for bees and butterflies. Swift flying astronauts, they flitted above the meadow, among the beech and birch, and darted low into the lilacs. They chanted their mantic song as they wind, winged from eve to eve, searching for the perfect place to build their nest. When May arrived, I discovered that they were nesting in our woodshed's peak, where the rafters rise church-like, and where the, above the roof the weather vane rings out squeaky tunes, metronome of change turned by sudden winds. I found the nest on a dark rafter where safety should have dwelled. Next day, some plotting predator broke down the nest and stole its future brood. On the shed floor, I gathered fragile spells, shells of possibility unborn, and as I did, the Phoebes called and called. Mm -hmm. Well, the robins are busy around my the place. The robins right are now. very busy <laughs> ar around around everywhere. Yeah. Okay, and then one final poem from this book called "Through Windows." Journeying to somewhere we think we need to go, we look in lighted windows on our way, catch glimpses of the private worlds inside that seem to shine with luminescent gold, transforming ordinary rooms to things so perfect and unreachable, our looking brings us emptiness and pain. Inside may be a woman writing at a desk, a couple sitting at their evening meal, their table glowing in the candlelight, their crystal glasses shimmering red with wine, perhaps an upstairs room alert with eager waiting, an antique bed with covers folded down, and slippers placed for someone yet to come. And in the dark, desire overwhelms us, to take possession of the lives we see, to penetrate the private worlds of strangers and hold them frozen in their fleeting moment as if they held the key to what eludes us, means to grasp what always lies beyond us, revealed and disappearing in seconds as we pass. I, re I remember that I workshopped that poem at the Frost Place and um, the fellow, my fellow members of the workshop said, I didn't like the poem at all, but the 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 the, uh, the, the poet and who why was, didn't they <laughs> like it? <laughs> they said it was uh, trite and a, a, a cliche. Uh, but then B. H. Fairchild, who was the poet who was mm -hmm. running the workshop, said this poem needed to be written, and and oh. and had something very important to tell us. So I, I, I felt very vindicated by that. I think the image of the. You know, a, a, somebody sitting at a desk and a couple at their meal, that's very rich. She, yes. She's got some lovely imagery yeah. of just sitting at the de you know, sitting at a table mm -hmm. in a room. In it, a it takes you back yeah. to uh, Dickinson, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that I had been hungry all the years. My yes. noon had come to right. dine and yes. lo looking yes. into the window, yeah. that yeah. Yeah. the hunger entering. And yeah, that, uh, definitely there's, um, vo the voices of my poetry are, are certainly uh, forged in, ma in the works of many other poems. Poets. I, the poem I'm going to read from Bloodroot uh, is a climbing poem, so it, it makes me think of the poem you oh, just read about uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the Shataya poem. And this is called Reflections on Climbing Ayers Rock. It's not the great red sandstone rock itself that terrifies, though the way it rises like a mighty island from the dry and barren plain impresses. Not its height or girth, nor its isolation not its age or geological origin. No, but there's a power in the rock you do not feel when you begin. You think it's just a rock, a giant sandstone rock, another climb you want to make and will. You'll take a picture at the top and show it to your friends. You're not afraid. 
It's not the warning signs you've read below, the lists of those who've fallen to their deaths. You've climbed before, have stood on canyon rims, walked paths too narrow for a mountain goat. You know the risks. You've never fallen. You think it's just an ordinary climb. It's not. It's not the going up the naked trail, the hand rope you must stoop to reach, or the way the bending slope offers no place to catch you if you slip, but halfway up, you sense a force that wants you down. You've read the signs which tell you the Aborigines will not climb this rock and hold it sacred, its trail a dream track only spirits walk. For them, the giant rock's name is Uluru. It's not that you're a coward, you're not. It's not that you believe in spirits, you don't. But you have felt a sudden earthquake in your heart, a trembling weakness in your legs, and a hand that wants to push you off. Well, it's a very different view of, of climbing, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, again, it, um, I think it's talking about the masks we sometimes wear when we think we can do something and all of a sudden we discover we can't. But there's a power to that poem. There's yeah. power mm -hmm. in that yeah, poem. Yeah. Okay. It's the power to know when you can't do something. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, that is a power to when you know that. <laughs> yeah, to recognize when you should, yeah, we should exactly. stop. And I'm just going to end by a couple of new poems. I've gotten very interested in uh, two, two things that seem to be appearing in my poems. One is the fact that I live so near the Connecticut River, and it, and it does it influence what I write, thinking about that river. And the other is um, I'm very interested in dreams. Uh, I'm not a Freudian or a Jungian in, in terms of what I think dreams do, but I'm very interested in the way dreams play and the way we think about dreams. So here's a poem called Dream River. When there are no dreams, sleep is as dark and silent as the river that flows beyond our house, the mind and body yielding to its slow and steady glide as if we were floating from the source to the mouth and would go on across wide seas that never reach land, a passage with no coming back, a sleep we cannot summon or refuse, a sleep where desire does not dwell, where pain is gone. When dreams come, the mind pretends to sleep and the body opens to strange places where seeds we thought we'd sowed with care sprout odd and unfamiliar plants, sorghum and sassafras for snowdrops, or poison oak where peonies should have grown. A baby goat lies in the nursery crib, a flight to Barcelona lands on Saturn, an avalanche of snow appears on a mountain at Udinata, a heat wave at Vostok Station. When these dreams come and I awake, I don my waders, take my buckets, and go to the river. I fill my pails and drink. Mm. So that's uh, one dream poem. And then the last one, called Butterfly Dreams, uh, was inspired by an a, 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 um, exhibit I saw at the National Gallery of, of Japanese um, paintings by Ito ja Jakuchu. And uh, in it, he quotes uh, the philosopher, um, I in a comment on one of his paintings, he quotes the philosopher Zhangji, who had a dream about a butterfly. And so this is a poem is called Butterfly Dreams. Two dozen swallowtail butterflies once feasted on the lilac bush outside our kitchen door, golden yellow blossoms among the purple plumes. I have never dreamed of butterflies, though I've heard that when we dream of them, we are imagining a coming transformation in our lives, where we emerge at the end of that cycle of egg, larva, pupa, imago, wings opening, flying free. A dream of promise. But I ref prefer the dream of Zhang, Dui, Zhang Zui, who dreamed he was a butterfly, and when he woke, wondered if he was himself again, or if he was instead a butterfly dreaming that he was a man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, ties right into the yeah. ending of Rich's Diving in, in the Wreck yes, poem exactly. and the whole issue of, of androgyny and the masks we wear and who we are. Right. Yeah. Oh, oh, that was just so inspiring. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. And Ivy. Well, talk about dreams. I actually dreamt last night that I, I went to my office on campus, and it was, it was the former office of Adrian Rich. <laughs> and, it, and in this office, it was a huge office. In this office was t just tons of stuff. I mean, just kind of covered with, and, and I could describe some of the things that were in there. But one of the things that was in there was a huge tree. An old, like the office had been built around a huge tree. And people were coming to see this tree. And, and the tree kind of had like an image on it. It was kind of like an old, I, this was my dream last night. So I have wow. There's a poem there. There's, <laughs> There's a poem there. There's a poem there. One of the, one of the um, maybe it will be for blood root. Yes, <laughs> I'm going to work on that poem. Um, what I one of the um, characteristics that I um, 
admire the most in, in Rich's poetry is the way she marries personal feeling, personal emotion to historical and public issues. Yeah. And so that, that, that the poem Diving, in the Rec, and Diving Into the Wreck can be writ personally about her personal life, but it's also really about collectively what we're going through, what many people are going mm -hmm. through. And that's really hard to do. Yeah. And it's really hard to be, I find it very hard to write politically because you're always sounding polemical or you're ranting yeah. or you're lecturing, and that's death to poetry. So it's been interesting to me when I started to write my poems about diving, literally scuba diving, I went back to the rich poem to see how she, how she managed to make it into an allegory that didn't clobber you over the head with its allegorical meaning, with its political meaning. Mm -hmm. Very hard to do. Thought Only Grace Paley could do it. With I think Grace Paley could do it, yes. Yeah. I, I thought a lot about Grace Paley. Um, as I was reading, mm -hmm. rereading Rich. So I'd like to read a couple of these, uh, I have three of these, I've, I've got a bunch of diving poems, I'll read a few of them, and then I, I wanted to just end with uh, a more contemporary poem by Rich. Mm. To end it. So this one is called Veiled Relations, and it's kind of a fun, it's got some gestures to it. Gagged by the regulator, we are reduced to gesture and mime. Always the Boy Scout, my husband reviews the crucial signs before we submerge. Okay. In trouble. Out of air. <laughs> Tired. Hungry. Surface. Not the common motions, because diving is not commonsensical, because without words, everything changes. <clears throat> my son pings his knife on my tank slowly swings his masked face into view, brings finger and thumb together and apart. I scan the coral wall for a moray eel, head extruded, skin queasy green, gleaming with protective slime, working its jaws menacingly. I know it's only breathing, but my chest clenches. Shark is a spread hand on the crown of the head, like a dorsal fin. Sea turtle, my daughter's favorite, is one hand on top of the other, palms down, tongues flapping like flippered feet. See, we want to share, but are cocooned in silence, marooned in our private perceptions. Spotted trunkfish motors past bulgy eyes and long snout, its lips pursed, tiny pectoral fins rotating madly like a far-fetched wind-up toy. How to alert? My muzzled relations, figures scattered reef-wise, probing murky holes, prying out their separate, their own separate pleasures. So that's about being separated and being, and how language, I think, how language brings us together and what do you do when you don't have, how do you communicate when you don't, you don't have language. Um, it's, it makes me think a little bit of the Kunitz poem, uh, Kunipaksit. Oh, where he, mm -hmm, where he mm -hmm, s mm -hmm. uh, makes the mute sign for yes, father at yes. the end of the poem. I want to do this one too. Interesting diving poems. So here's one about a failure. Sweet dreams. <coughs> More dreams. Sweet mm -hmm. dreams. Yep. Sweet Dreams is our diving destination, easy in and out over bleached corals, ground to white sand, glare from the equatorial sun, nearly blinding as we shamble, laden like pilgrims to the ocean's rim in search of weightlessness. A giant Gorgonian at 20 feet marks our point of descent, floating over a flora of corals to the edge of the wall, drifting dreamily through viscous light the tempo of our bodies slowed to a crawl, so engrossed in looking we almost forget to sip the air, falling through light, falling out of ourselves, like flying in reverse, until the darkness of the depth wells up like a stealthy chill, and I fumble for the inflator, a little puff or two in my vest to buoy me up against the argosy of myself under so much water, but the button sticks jets me to the surface in panic seconds where I bob, helpless supplicant, in the careless sea, ringed by horizons 
and aloof shores. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then, um, rabbit hole. My husband likes to go deep first, so we hurry through the cheerful shallows where light and fish cavort to the edge of the reef wall at 30 feet and plunge down headlong into the murk like acrobats without a net. Why do we see seek the deep against the logic of terra firma? Silence, a bath of brine, the tang of danger in every regulated breath. Reaching the sandy bottom at 100 feet, still dimly lit from above, what looks like thick grass morphs into a mob of garden eels snaked out of their holes, tiny heads like the bulge at the end of a comma. Whoosh, they retract as we approach, the trick being not to get too close, the trick being to engage in order to disengage, forget the pressure, the evanescence. Then my computer beeps, warning we have only minutes to live at this profundity, so we float up the far side of the reef till we crest it at the safer depths of 60 feet. It's crowned with huge coral formations and fantastic hues and shapes that dwarf us and our puny purposes, our needs unreeling from the surface until the line is all played out. Appropriate for a site named Alice in Wonderland, where whimsy beyond human making almost lets us forget the longing to be wrapped and cradled in the slumberless sea. Now I'm thinking there's layers to this poem. I'm hearing, I'm hearing a lot going on in this poem. And some of it, to my ear, is very sexual. Hmm. Well, it's often about my husband and I yes. arriving together uh -huh. and the intimacy, yeah. which is a strange intimacy because you're totally separate because you've got a mask on, yeah. you've got a regulator, you can't talk, right. you've got, yeah. sometimes you have gloves on, not often. Well, I used to scuba dive with my yeah. family too, so I certainly can relate to everything you're saying. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. Yeah, I just was thinking. an answering call? <laughs> 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 I, I've, never, I've never scuba dived dive, but I have uh, snorkeled, and this oh, is a poem good. about snorkeling. And it's called Near Drowning Off Tulum, Ooh. and this is out in Mexico. Blue-green water swells and roils around my body, slaps my face, fogs my mask, world of calm and silence, gone. The battered fishing boat, my life preserver, its Mayan captain who drive, dropped us into a quiet sea, gone. The reef, its coral branches, starfish, seaweed, silver, blue, and yellow fish in the garden below me, gone. Some giant squid or ter ter pterodactyl has snatched the others. Gone. I am alone, as if I have fallen from an ocean liner, far from land. I cannot see its smoke or hear its engine. No warning blasts, no lifeboat. Gone. Just the rough beating of the angry sea against my mask, whiteness of my watered, withered hands, my webbed feet. On the beach somewhere on another planet, a few bikini-clad oiled bodies entice the morning sun. Palm trees bent in worship of the wind. Children flirt with the mounting waves, ride them with rodeo daring, whooping, tumbling. In foam and sand, they are tossed to land. Near the shore, pelicans and terns troll for fish. I flail, kick, swim towards a land I can no longer see. Gone. Something cold touches me. My body stiffens. A shark, stingray, man of war, another bump, a firm hand. Our guide smiles at me. I see the others. Terror and the angry waves gone. I am safe again, for now. Well, of course, that's a sort of a tongue-of-cheek poem, right, right. but, uh, but it, I, I thought it related yeah, no, a little no, bit to is, that, that is, the experience so. in water when all of a sudden you realize yeah. Yeah. you're the out of... The tang of danger. Yeah. yeah. The tang of danger. So should I uh, have one more poem? Sure. One yes, more go. diving poem, and then I'll maybe re end with a... Well, the rich poem. End with is a rich a, poem? Okay. Yeah. It's called Field of Vision. This is, this is, this is the... Um, I think this is related to the near... Near drowning drowning yeah. poem because it's like, let's not do the scary stuff. Let's just do <laughs> yeah. the really easy. Feel the vision. The mask, like a wimple, limits, or rather focuses our gaze as shapes and colors brim and riot. At the edges, we can just glimpse the unknown and swivel our heads slowly to greet it. Reclusive drumfish flits nervously inside a crevice. Tiny banded shrimp beckon 
from cleaning stations in the bulbous arms of anemones. The guidebook advises, remember to look out away from the coral wall for pelagics, depth dwellers from beyond the continental shelf who deign to visit the bustling reef. But gazing into featureless blue hurts like stranded or abandoned, hurts like an infinite sky up too close, too much nothing. So while hammerheads prowl and green turtles flap somewhere out there, we tail a pair of gray angelfish, huge and bug-eyed, with <laughs> bright yellow lips hovering piously together under a ledge so far, yet barely 20 feet from shore. Mm. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> yeah. It's very Let's disturbing. Do <laughs> Let's do the safe stuff. Yeah. So I wanted to end with... Um, do you have a picture of, of Rich in some of your books? Maybe hold it up for the camera. Yeah, there she is. That's one of her yeah. famous pictures. Yeah. That yeah. one is there's, there's, there's a lovely one. Um, I've seen a, a more recent one. She's a, she was very petite and always had short pixie hair. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So this is from a volume, um, I think this is poems 1998 to 2000, and it's just called Fox. Mm. And the fox becomes a kind of, the vixen becomes a persona for the poet. Mm -hmm. If your name is on the list. If your name is on the list of judges, you're one of them. Though you thought their hardening assumptions went and stood alone by the window while they concurred. It wasn't enough to hold your singular minority opinion. You had to face the three bridges down the river, your old ambitions flamboyant in blood-stained mist. You had to carry off underarm and write up in perfect loneliness your soul-splitting descent. Yes, I know a soul can be partitioned like a country in all the new and here old judgments, loyalties crumbling, send up sparks and smoke. We want to be part of the future, dragging in what's pure futurity what pure futurity can't use. Suddenly, a narrow street, a little beach, a little century screams, don't let me go, don't let me die. Do you forget what we were to each other? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Great point, great point. Oh, well, Ivy Phyllis, thank you both You're welcome. so very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you for your time and for your expertise. Mm -hmm. It, that was just really great. And I want mm -hmm. to thank the audience for joining us today to celebrate Poetry Month and to celebrate Blood Roots' fifth, uh, fifth birthday. We proudly launched Volume 5 this year. So please visit us on our website, bloodrootlm.com. Visit us on Facebook for Blood Root Literary Magazine. I'm Doe Roberts. Thank you.